So I am here at the September edition of the Made Showcase, where we have, I think, something like 15 developers that are showing off their games. There are tables set up with monitors and people running their games on their laptops and keyboards. And I'm also joined by Mason, the executive director, who Hello. helps plan these events. How do you feel tonight? Oh, tonight's looking great. Uh, I think I see like 40-something people up here filling out our classroom. We've got a game over floating in Swan's Marketplace, and we've got some games outside too, so people are enjoying the museum downstairs. But up here's where it's at. We got, what, yeah, 15 different games that I've played a few of them because they keep coming back. But yeah, super exciting. But some newcomers as well. We got some yeah. people that are showcasing not just for the first time here, but for the first time ever. Like ever. It's really cool to hear how much people are getting out of this kind of playtesting and showcasing because they learn way more than they thought they were going to, especially if, if they haven't showcased their game before. It's I was just talking to somebody about uh, what I think is the most important part, which is that uh, we all love making the game, d uh, designing it, programming, putting it together. That's the real where the passion comes from. But one of the really big parts, actually the part that's going to make your game successful, comes from the business side and the marketing yeah. side. And that's what you can practice in a place like this, except for it's with these people that are really friendly. They've come out to play these kind of games. So it's the perfect place to develop those kind of like soft skills and marketing skills and get your game seen while continuing to develop it. Yeah, and even if you're like launching your game on itch, you know, you might not be trying to sell it for money, but you know, you are trying to build your portfolio and get it out there and try to have as many people as possible enjoy it. And so having these events where you can trim off the rough edges and recognize those rough edges, uh, it can, it's just invaluable. It's, it's awesome to see. It's a great turnout tonight. You're making me think that we need to do a game jam here because <laughs> I kind of like the rough edges sometimes. But we, yeah, yeah, this is a great place to get rid of the rough edges. But we should plan another a game one. jam. <laughs> well, the last time that we had a game jam here, uh, Gravitorium, one of the games, ended up, ended up on Steam and came out. So yeah, we, we got to get I, them out here to do a talk. I think there's some sort of magic sauce up here. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks, Mason. Yeah. Um, uh, excited. I can't wait to hear some of the interviews you take with some of these other devs. Okay, so I'm here with Mike, who made Puzzle Spy International. Can you tell me a little bit about the game? The game is a 1960s retro spy adventure, like James Bond, only instead of karate chops and car chases and gunplay, there's thinky puzzles. So each puzzle in the game is a bespoke, usually wordplay puzzle, and you've got to go through them to travel around the world and solve the case. What games were you inspired by? Obviously, James Bond was a visual inspiration, but... A lot of, we, we do a lot of Puzzled Pint, which is a monthly event. It's not a video game thing at all, but we love doing it. It's a, a monthly puzzle event that happens in a city near you because it happens all over the world. And you have to solve a puzzle on their website to <laughs> figure out where it's going to be. But they usually, every month, there's at least one in Oakland. Sometimes there's also one in Berkeley, too. There's a couple of in, in San Francisco and the South Bay. We try to attend it every month. And there's these fun brain teaser puzzles. Uh, as far as other video games, uh, Device uh, 6, the Room series, mm -hmm. just other games that have fun, thinky elements to them. And that's the neat thing about Puzzled Pint. And then the thing that we tried to bring to our game is that every time you have a puzzle in this game, it's totally different. It's not like a Sokoban where you're building on top of, okay, now I know how to do this. Now that builds onto this. Now that builds onto that. It's like each puzzle is its, its own unique bespoke thing that part of the challenge is what am I supposed to do here figuring out what that challenge is and then solving it it's is kind of a nice short game eight really fun thinky puzzles and a story attached to them uh, very visual novel style story we're actually using RenPy which is a visual novel designed engine so those parts are super easy to build and add some branching dialogue and some conversations and some really neat mid-century modern style uh, artwork and the, the game has really beautiful art and these incredible character portraits. And I know that your background is as a game artist. So can you tell me a little bit about how you went from that to building Puzzle Spy International? Well, uh, I've been working in the games industry for decades. 
Uh, my last job was at a small mobile game studio, and I was there through the pandemic, uh, and then I got laid off, as people are often want to do in the games industry. And I was, I was out of work for about a year and a half, but somewhere in the middle there, I'm like, I've got to make a game. This is what I do, is I make games, and I'm not making a game. Yeah. But I'm not a programmer. And the couple of times that I've teamed up with a programmer to make a game, it's like, I'll do all the art, you do all the programming. There have been great collaborations that always die when someone, usually the programmer, says, well, I just got a job, i got to get back to work, I'm, go I'm going back to work for Remedy, or or wherever I'm working. So I was like, well, what kind of game can I make that won't involve much programming? And so RenPy is super easy to pick up. Making a visual novel is really easy with it. Uh, it's just the simple scripting. Yeah. And some of the stuff I'm figuring out how to make the puzzle aspects, which are kind of pushing the engine, not what it was meant to do. And so I've gotten a little bit of help. But the bulk of it is being done by my wife and I, actually. My wife and I are co-writing it co-designing all the puzzles along with a third friend who does a lot of puzzle design. The puzzle that I'm actually here testing tonight, the first puzzle in the game, is one entirely that my wife and I designed. Well, Puzzle Spy International, where can people find it and what platforms is it going to be on? Uh, it's going to be on Steam and probably Itch as well, but Steam is our main goal. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a Steam page. We're working towards that, but you can follow us on Instagram at Puzzle Spy International, all one word, and that's where my dev blog is. Nice. And yeah, definitely take a look at the art. It's truly beautiful. So thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Jen. We're here with Mark Wilson, who is demoing COG the Rogue Machine. Is that the right name? Yeah, that's correct. So COG is a game about a lowly worker who works for a mysterious big corporation mining for something they call Scrip in this in this giant cave of a machine. He doesn't really know why he's doing this, but he goes through, he collects Scrip for the company, and then he eventually dies and he tries again. It's a roguelite, so there's a lot of dying. It started as a prototype for a game jam two years ago, and it was originally very arcadey. Just go, like, survive in a single room for as long as you can. And it has evolved over the, the two years into this uh, roguelike game with very like intentionally designed levels and all kinds of extra upgrades and stuff. And the art style is kind of minimalistic. It's like uh, white characters on a black background. Yeah, so I mean, I'm trying to do a one-bit-like style. I call it one-bit-ish. I, I like one-bit games, but I did want to do a little bit more just to add a little touch of flourish to it. It's very, very inspired visually by Downwell, and that's just because I wanted to pay homage to that game in multiple ways. Um, but there are other games like Gato Roboto that utilize that style really well, I thought. And, yeah, I just wanted to kind of expand on that. And what have you, what have you gotten out of uh, showcasing at the Maid so far? Showcasing has been great in a lot of different ways, you know. Learning how to talk about the game, learning how to watch people play it and, and get good feedback out of that and just generally talking design with other devs who are also showcasing has been great. It's a, it's a fun experience all around no matter what I end up getting out of it on any given attempt. <laughs> Where can people learn more about it and um, is it available yet? There is a Steam page if you search for COG, the Rogue Machine. If you go to my website lostgenerationgames.com you can sign up for my email list. There should be a link to a Discord server on there. I am running playtests in the Discord server for people who are interested. So if you want to get access to it early, you can. Nice. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. So I'm here with Jake, who is the maker of Glitch Dungeon, which is a... I'm, I want to describe it as like a pixel-perfect puzzle platformer. Is that That's a good... That's what I have on my Steam tags, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, that's perfect. That's pretty good, yeah. yeah. Uh, tell me about the origin of the game and, and kind of what inspired it. This was started as a game jam kind of game way back, I'd say like seven, eight years ago that oh, I made. Wow, okay. And basically the idea then was I wanted a game where you could just like switch between mechanics. You like switch okay. colors to do that. And as I was building the like platformer script for it, I was building it in JavaScript, the original game. I was like running into a lot of bugs that were actually kind of interesting. One of them was 
I forgot to reset the on ground flag whenever you were walking off a platform. Yeah. So you would just keep walking and not fall down. I was like, oh, that's a pretty cool mechanic. So I incorporated these as like glitch spells. I basically have tried to take that and make it a more full game. So it's definitely like pixel art inspired. The theme of the game is all like glitchy. So I've got like an old CRT shader applied on it. Whenever you die by touching the glitch things, which are basically just like a bunch of dither effects with like different color filters applied to them, um, the whole screen glitches out. Um, I've done like playtasting events with friends, um, friends and coworkers. But this is the first time I've been in person at a public place where just anyone can come up. Honestly, I'm really nervous. I've never done one of these before, but yeah, it's really fun. I, I am taking a lot of notes because a lot of people are just like running into stuff that like I either am too used to the game, so I don't know that it is confusing or I thought it was confusing, but I still someone, you know, messes up in like a slightly different way. But yeah. um, I've, it's been very helpful to kind of see that. So And the game is called Glitch Dungeon. Yeah, Glitch Dungeon Crystal, Glitch Dungeon. Engine, um, is also online but it's like that's the game jam version okay. um, and it is on Steam I have a Steam page so you can go wishlist it uh, it's not out yet and it's also on itch.io the demo's there too so yeah look it up <laughs> if you want awesome well thanks Jake cool. thank you so much Jed Cool. So I'm here with Timmy, who is the maker of, what's the name of your game again? Rhythm Quest. Rhythm Quest, which is, it looks like it's running on Switch and mobile and computer. And it is a game where you have two buttons. One, one of them you press to jump and the other one you press to attack. And you have to do it all to the beat of the music, which my understanding is that you did all the music. Yeah, I did everything for the game, actually. So all the music and the sounds and the art and animations. And I, I played it a little bit, and it, it is very, very sticky in the sense that I sat down and I just wanted to keep playing it. That kind of game feel doesn't happen by accident. What was your process to get there, and have you done a lot of playtesting for this game, too? Um, I've done a little bit of playtesting, but honestly, a lot of it is built upon previous experience that I've had. So I did have a game called Ripple Runner that I think took second place in one of the Ludum Dare game jams. Oh, cool. And it's wow. a very similar concept, a platformer rhythm game hybrid. People seem to like it a lot. I liked it a lot. You know, it really worked to my strengths as someone who can make music for my own rhythm game. I think that makes a really big difference. So yeah, I think a lot of this just came out of that. It's always nice watching people play the game live because it's not just always about how, how many levels they complete or how fast they get through or what scores they're getting, but sometimes it's what they're doing inside the levels. A lot of people will like to jump on every beat and I remember one of my earlier playtests that wasn't really facilitated by my game. If you did that, you would actually actively lose. Um, but people wanted to do it anyways. They wanted yeah. to attack on every beat, kind of like someone who's playing DDR, they wanted to step on every beat, right? And I was like, okay, well, the players seem to really want to do this. I should make it so that they can if they really want to. I definitely am a fan of DDR. It's in my alias, DDR Kirby. I think it's really cool how there are a lot of different rhythm games that have the same basic concepts, you know, just you know, pressing buttons to the music, but the design philosophy and emphasis is very different. You know, I think I was looking at a video of Unbeatable the other day, and that's another rhythm game, uh, and they are very, I can see just from a screenshot that they want to have this very hyped up arcade feel because there's like, the score counter is like right there and everything is like big and exciting and it's got this really cool vibe. Whereas if you look at my game, there's no score counter or anything. I really want to eliminate as much as possible so that you can get that feel that I think you were experiencing when you were playing it, which is I'm just kind of connecting with the game one-on-one -on -one, and I just kind of get sucked in and then all of a sudden two hours have gone by, right? It, it is pretty incredible that I, I was able to fall into a flow state so quickly. Um, so, uh, where can people find the game? Is there like a wishlist page up? Yeah, there is a wishlist page up on Steam. I think if you just go to rhythmquestgame.com, um, that'll have all the information and all the links. There is a detailed devlog, there's a link to the Steam page, and more importantly, there's a link to the free demo. You can play it, you can download it, you can also play it in your browser, it works on the browser, and you can play uh, nine levels um, for free to get a taste of what the gameplay is like. Um, it'll go all the way to it gives you, uh, I think, two levels in World 3, which is where it kind of gets really spicy. So feel free to try that out. Well, thank you so much for showcasing and for sharing and excited to see what's next for it. Yeah, thank you very much. Gara is working on a game called Letters. Can you describe what the game is? So the game is a cozy post and letter delivery game. You play as an old postman going around the islands, talking to the villagers, trying to find what their problems are and solving their issues. 
the theme is mental health so it's about connecting these people on the island together because they kind of like don't like each other right now so the main movements are basically a bicycle you could jump you could do a wheelie don't ask why a 60 year old bike man <laughs> is doing a wheelie but yeah, you could pop a wheelie and you could just explore the island boost your way around it do crazy tricks and get stuck like he did over there <laughs> Well, it looks like it's still in development, but yes. it's made on Unreal. It looks like it's taking place on an island. You can see the ocean. There's a beach. The clouds are beautiful. The models don't have a lot of detail to them, so it's kind of yes. simple. But it's also just very calming and beautiful in the kind of that Animal Crossing kind of way. There's a few games. A short Hike is a great uh, inspiration, but also stuff like just cozy games in general. We want something that's more that you swerve around the world, is something where it's like you maneuver the world in a unique way. And we really kept searching on Steam and we just could not find a cozy bicycle game for some reason. Oh yeah. It's like, this is a time to do it. You know, growing up, I played a lot of games with action combat and you're killing guys and such, but I like to kind of make games that are different than action-based games. I like to make games where you could just relax and have a good time and also have a positive message. Because in this island, a lot of the people are struggling with mental health issues. And when you talk to them, you could kind of help them get over it, get it over them and such. Nothing revolutionary, just like a simple plot. And it's a cozy vibe where you're just trying to bring people together. Uh, how long have you been working on it? Just two months now. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. You made a lot of progress. Yeah. And then there's two months left. It's for a game jam. Oh, it's four okay. months. It's called Safer Together. That's the, where the theme comes from. Yeah. So... We have, we're five people just working together, having a great time, very talented team. And uh, hopefully we release this on uh, something like Steam maybe in two months, who knows, we'll see. Hey, is this your first playtesting event or have you done, done these before? I've done one before, but okay. I could not consider it as a playtesting event because there was a bug where the bike guy just kept stuttering the entire time and <laughs> it was unplayable. Got it. A few people here remember it, it was a nightmare. Oh no. And now that they see the game, they're like, oh my God, dude, it's playable. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you coming out. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just played Three Bulky Bears by Cameron Dodd. Can you tell me a little bit about the game? Yeah, so Three Bulky Bears is a 2D level-based platformer. You switch between the three bears, Baby Bear, Mama Bear, and Papa Bear, and each one has different abilities, different controls, interacts with obstacles differently, and you have to be strategic about when you change to get through each level. I went to UC Santa Cruz and I just graduated this spring and this was our capstone project. So I pitched it in January and several people joined and it's had a weird rocky development but now we're, we're free from UC Santa Cruz and we're just developing it on our own time to get it out. The general idea was like something I had several years ago. Very heavy inspiration from Super Meat Boy, it's sort of the, the overall structure yeah. we have many short levels that are somewhat difficult so the time isn't necessarily just getting through all the levels it's like you know trying to beat them and then there's there's different objectives in each level so there's a porridge that you can collect a bowl of porridge that you can collect and then each level has a gold star time where if you beat it fast enough you get a gold star and that's like extra hard it doesn't unlock anything right now but we're working on it <laughs> do you know what platforms are going to launch it on yeah so we're on steam okay. that's Three Bulky Bears, you can wishlist it now. We're planning to launch in November, see how that holds. Uh, might be a little later in the year, but that's the plan right now, and we're, we're roughly on track. It's always wild playtesting uh, with strangers. Every piece of feedback you get is incredibly valuable, and you have to take the good with the bad. It makes the game better, then now I can go fix that. The general piece of advice that I give to game developers who are early on in the process is play test your game as early as possible because you'll see things that you just don't see on a day in, day out basis when you're developing the game. I've found especially that difficulty and tutorialization and, and intuitiveness of controls, that particularly is very, very hard to get a beat on without extensive play testing because you're just too close. You know, as yeah. well, you play it every day and a level that feels really easy to you is doesn't make any sense to somebody who with exactly. fresh eyes. Yeah, this kind of event is the perfect place to really hone in a tutorial. Cameron, thanks for chatting with us and uh, hopefully go people go find it when it launches. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks.
The Made Showcase happens on the first Friday of every month and it's always a great time. If you're interested in bringing a game or creation, visit themade.org slash showcase and we'll save you a table. The games you just heard about will be linked in the show notes for this episode. If you've got any thoughts, questions, corrections, or museum ideas, shoot us an email at info at themade.org. Our fully interactive museum is located at 921 Washington Street in beautiful downtown Oakland. Hours are noon to 7 on Wednesdays and Thursdays, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Fridays and Saturdays, and 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Sundays. Thank you especially to our members and Patreon supporters who help keep the maid afloat. I'm Jed. We'll see you next time.